Now, to get the webinar started, here is Greg Zastro from Multitech. Greg? Hey, thanks, Steve. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today titled IoT Connectivity, It's a New World. Today, we're going to present some valuable information on the Internet of Things marketplace with an emphasis on IoT connectivity technology options. It's a broad area. We're going to be covering what are the best ways to connect my things, which can be loosely interpreted as assets in the field or sensor data, to the Internet for various applications, and, and why does that make sense? But first, a one-sentence description of Multitech and what we do. So Multitech designs, develops, and manufactures communications equipment for the industrial Internet of Things and has been helping customers for over 45 years. It's a very exciting and dynamic industry to be helping our customers all stay connected. So I'm your moderator, Greg Zastro, today, and I am joined with our highly qualified presenter, Michael Finnegan, Director of IoT Business Development. So let's take a quick look at the agenda. First, we'll start with the promise of the Internet of Things. And just in summary, it's huge. And then we're going to talk about how and where Internet of is, uh, IoT is used, where does it best fit, and why. And then talk about why is IoT growing. It's, it's more than just a technology looking for a home. It solves business problems and social problems. Then we'll talk about some connectivity technologies, what are some of the more common ones that are out there today. And then we'll talk about LPWA. Um, I'm not going to give away what, what that acronym means quite yet. It's going to be included as a polling question later on. Then we'll talk about some LoRa applications, talk about what is LoRa and where does it fit. And then we'll wrap it all up in the conclusion slide. So during uh, the presentation today, we're going to be asking a couple polling questions. So please answer them to the best of your ability, and then I'll share the group results. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Michael to take it away, but I'll be back during the polling questions. Michael? Thanks, Greg. I sure appreciate it. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Finnegan. I'm very pleased to be here with uh, Global Spec IEEE. Um, and I, a big shout out to the IEEE members uh, throughout, uh, throughout the country and throughout the world here. Um, but especially, I want to call out my, uh, my good friends at the IEEE Comsoc in uh, Santa Clara. So. Alan Weisenberg's folks out there, and I uh, appreciate you guys taking care of me over the last few years and uh, inviting me to be a presenter at your, at your meetings uh, throughout, uh, throughout the year. Anyways, I want to say uh, what a pleasure it is to be here to talk about the Internet of Things. It's a big topic, and so maybe a definition makes a whole lot of sense before we get into uh, some, of, uh, some of the details here. So what is the Internet of Things? Like the Internet itself, right, there, which is a network of networks connected together, what we're looking to do is to provide you know, connectivity and, uh, between uh, various machine elements, right, or machine-to-machine -machine communications. So this is a definition between connecting these non-human assets, right, which would be either uh, directly connected to one another or perhaps connected to a network or machine-to-network. And in this new world of machine-to-machine, uh, -machine, mm -hmm. um, we've now entered into the Internet of Things, where we're now seeing telemetry data being brokered up through clouds and, or maybe even cloud-to-cloud -cloud communications. So um, where we used to have just purpose-built networks, now we're seeing um, data being able to be sent directly to nodes um, to be able to uh, interrogate them and then be able to expand that information to be able to go and find some real useful information throughout. So the Internet of Things is broad, and, uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to talk a, a little bit about some of the connectivity options and where we're going to go with that. But first, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the ne this next slide here. So um, here we go. I jumped the slide there, brothers, and pushed out. Great. So what we're seeing here is a representation of what Gardner calls the hype curve. Um, the position where we're at right now is at the peak of the hype curve, right? And, uh, and then what comes next? Well, we go into the trough of despair. Um, well, I actually believe that where we're at in this adoption of, in the market today is that we're a little bit uh, closer to, the, um, uh, to this, uh, this uh, depressed area where we're not quite hitting back into market expectations. But the reality is that we're seeing an awful lot of uh, buzz in the marketplace and uh, where, we're, where we're at in adoption uh, isn't quite meeting up with the hype. But let's talk about, um, about just the market size overall. So as we go into um, this next market size, 
we can we do know it's not just big, but a huge market. And I have to say that you can't have an Internet of Things presentation without talking about how huge it is. Uh, between 50 billion devices by 2020, or if you look at what uh, GE or General Electric says, uh, 15 trillion dollars worth of global GDP to be produced in about uh, the next 20 years. Yes, that's with a T trillion. And then uh, Cisco uh, claims about $19 trillion worth of value in 2020. And, uh, and Gardner says about $3 billion in incremental revenue by 2020. Now, all these uh, uh, size recommendations or, or forecasts on the market, personally, I don't believe it means a whole lot, right? So I was recently in a, uh, in a meeting, um, an event with uh, Peggy Smedley down in, um, in San Diego. And Joe Baraki, one of the analysts, came up and he said, look, this, this isn't about size. It's about, about outcome-driven events. And I actually really believe that because it's not so much about how many devices we actually connect out there. It's what, what do we do with it? Um, and what's the outcomes from them? Now, we're, pretty, we're in a pretty, um, um, I'd say, nascent industry right now. And we haven't quite got to the point where we're seeing total gains or real return on investments. Sure, there are some uh, areas which are more mature, uh, like telematics and vehicle communication, where we see real ROIs. But now we're really starting to dig into uh, adoption rates right now, and uh, we're just starting to see that information come through. So size is important, but really I think we have to have a reality check, right? So in our reality check, what's coming up? What are we, what are we deploying today? Well, today... In the U.S. market, uh, according to statistics in 2015, these were provided to us by uh, uh, James Bremen Associates. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, connectivity options here, but primarily what we'll be looking at in our presentation today is not the wireline connections, but what are wireless connections uh, today. So if we look at the total number of adoption today, it's a, little, it's a far cry from the 50 billion that's proclaimed in, in just a few short years from now. Um, so currently we're about 60 million connected devices, and about 57 million of those, uh, of those 60 million are cellular-based. And why? Because it's ubiquitous network. Uh, then we go beyond those uh, ubiquitous uh, land-based uh, cellular technologies, and then we need to move to, uh, to satellite-type communications. And then there's a new category, low-powered wide area networking. And this is an area that's really starting to take off. Very small number of connections currently, but the projections of where these are going is huge. So how and where are these being used? We're going to take just a few minutes to talk about some use cases, and then we're going to get into the technology itself. So we're seeing all kinds of um, applications take off and develop throughout uh, the Internet of Things, and a lot of these areas are growing at a very fast rate. Uh, at, at least adoption rates, year-over-year year, year year adoption rates for about 45% all the way up to about 35%, and at the lowest part of the market, about 11%. And really, industrial I, IoT has a really big mainstream. Over half of these are connected um, uh, monitoring-type solutions. In addition, we're also seeing an awful lot of telematics solutions, but each of these industries are taking off at an alarming rate. At Multitech, we focus primarily on um, several key market areas. So these are some of the ones that we're going to chat about today, uh, where we're seeing some pretty big impacts, where we have social impacts as well as economic impacts. So areas like uh, agriculture, energy, healthcare, and finance, and monitoring. And then there's some technologies that really find themselves very useful um, in, uh, based on, on their attributes. So why is it growing, right? It's, uh, there's, it's, fa it's a fast for a, a emergent, emergency response. Um, it's improving in quality of our uh, quality of life. It's more efficient for food production and distribution. And safer and less congested highways. These are all benefits and outcome-based solutions for deploying of IoT. But we'll talk about the numbers. Um, and about a clean environment and more uh, utilization uh, uh, for energy re resources and how to, have, uh, how to take care of these precious resources that we have. You know, GE did a study uh, just recently uh, about the economic impact. And if we look at just changing one per, or improving by 1% across any of these industries, we can see a huge economic impact. And so as much as $267 billion over the next 15 years just by changing 1%. And so uh, we're, we're seeing great advancements in, uh, in both oil, 
power, healthcare, aviation, and rail, these are all being adopted at, at alarming rates. And as exciting as, as the economic impact is, uh, I, I actually believe the social impact has a much bigger uh, realistic um, uh, uh, impact for our lives, right? So when we look at uh, you know, one million lives saved in Saharan Africa uh, over the next five years just by the improvements that we're making using uh, these connected devices, or 40 million people that uh, in developing countries um, now are fed thanks to, to agricultural advancements and, and moving uh, which, you know, from uh, table, uh, from store to table, from crop to table. And then uh, week by week, um, uh, how we driving in our, in, our, in our congested streets, I know looking at these advancements right now make a, a real significant impact. impact. Carbon, um, uh, carbon emissions and saving over 1.2 billion trees and, uh, and over 180 million people are now educated due to these, some of these advancements. And then lastly, but I think probably one of the most important here is one out of, one out of nine people lives will be saved in highway accidents by having connected emergency response vehicles. So these have a direct impact. I think these are the outcomes that we're really looking at. So let's take a look at, uh, at, at communication options and really where this evolution of communication is happening today. So this is, we're at a point in time where um, it's really exciting. This is the first time in the history of telecommunications uh, we have now have a single, um, single technology um, that we can come to from a cellular perspective. But in addition, we're also adopting new technologies that are looking at instead of broadband, but into tiny data and how we connect devices that really take very small amounts of data. So now we have lots of options. And in the past, I was very focused uh, personally in my career about how to take and make connected devices using cellular technologies. I believe now that the best way to be, make the biggest impact is to look at a hybrid approach, to take a look at a holistic way of looking at communication options to really optimize how to make this uh, connectivity happen. So let's dive into it, uh, of where some of the popular areas are. Connectivity challenges, right? Uh, the Internet of Things uh, equals 80% of the volume, right? So where, is, where are these connected devices and how do we need to bring them on? Well, some of the requirements are that we need to have them to be battery powered because many of these devices or elements out in the network are in positions where we can't have a, a wireline powered instance. And so there'll have to be a battery, um, a, a battery to power those communication devices. They're in outdoors and harsh environments um, and they're long distance and, and perhaps, uh, you know, there is RF penetration problems with trying to get into those particular envir uh, environments. In addition, we're also looking at the number of devices, are, uh, is the sheer volume. And so we need to look at, at cost-effective ways of doing uh, communications. And also looking at low-power technologies so that we can use that precious resource called battery properly and look for robust communications and make sure that they're scalable and, more importantly, that there's security behind them. So, because I've been talking for a while, it's time for us to have a little polling question. So I'm going to invite uh, Greg to come on back and uh, help us with our first polling question. Greg? So I'm going to start off while Greg's coming back on board here. Uh, I'm here, Michael. I'm sorry. Fantastic. I'm here. So here's our first polling question. Like I mentioned earlier, um, please take a, take a look at that. Please answer it real quickly, and I'll share the results. Um, everyone has pretty much heard of cellular Wi-Fi and Bluetooth due to their uh, personal smartphones. And, you know, the Industrial Internet of Things uses many of these same connectivity technologies. However, like Michael mentioned earlier, um, some of these technologies or applications don't require the high data speeds and require very low power consumption because they're using batteries or solar. So that's where the LPWAN connectivity options can come into play. This requires a whole uh, different technology, and, and Michael will be giving some more information on that. And so as I see the, uh, the results here kind of gear up here, I think, uh, Michael, we, we have a great audience here to, uh, to help educate on what LPWAN means and what it means to uh, the future of IoT. Well, great, Greg. Let's let's post some of these uh, some of these results. I think you just did so, uh, and I'll push that out there one more time. 
Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of familiarity with it, at least for a good portion of it. And I have to say, speaking to the IEEE group, um, uh, perhaps some of you folks have uh, actually worked on some of these standards yourself or are part of the WARA Alliance or other uh, LPWA technologies. So surely appreciate uh, your contributions. But there's also uh, a lot of folks that are, are still looking to find out more about it. So let's dive into that. So in a broad stroke, there's many different technologies uh, out there. And when we look at the sheer numbers, you know, are we going to reach this you know, 56 or 50 billion devices by 2020? Well, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to say yes, right? When we look at you know, being uh, close to about 600 million devices, connected devices today in North America, I think we've got a long way to go. But I think if we start looking at how we look at the, uh, various connectivity options, including LAN, cellular, and low power wide area, I think we're gonna see you know, where these, these fit together and maybe complement one another. So uh, let's take a look at the LAN devices, right? So we have lots of different technologies, and Greg, as you mentioned, Bluetooth is, is, is well known, Wi-Fi is well known, and, uh, and to some degree, Zigbee, which is uh, um, an 802.16.4 technology using kind of um, a, a way to be able to do mesh networking to get the distances that we needed in the past. These are great options, right? Um, and in fact, they're great for mobile, in-home and short-range uh, applications. I would say that you know, Zigbee in itself uh, in its early stages could actually go further in industrial capabilities, but here's the challenge behind them. Um, they, they are set for certain amounts of bandwidth that they can be able to provide, and uh, the real drawback uh, that's uh, behind these are the battery life and the range that they can uh, happen. Um, so this is where we're gonna need to have more elements to be able to take uh, and repeat those signals and or take more power in the case, and if you're doing battery, it might not be the optimal way to be able to provide connectivity. But ultimately, you get one hop to a, a wired connection, which gets you uh, directly to, uh, to the internet or to a, connect, uh, to a purpose-built network. The next area is cellular. Now, as I mentioned before, I, I've always found cellular to be um, a really interesting value proposition for, uh, for, for folks uh, in that it's a ubiquitous network. And as I mentioned, this is the first time in the history of telecommunications that we have a single standard being LTE. Uh, but we have other flavors around the world um, that's maybe, uh, you know, we, we also have to uh, contend with. Um, so GSM, 3G technologies being both CDMA and HSPA+, uh, as well as this, these new technologies of, of LTE, and not just uh, the, the Category 3 LTE that we're very familiar with, with our, our phone technology, but now a newer version of, uh, of LTE that's coming out. These are great for long range high data rates and great coverage. The challenge is, um, because there's an awful lot of data that's being transmitted, um, we, have, we have battery challenges, right? And so, uh, as we all know, we're all searching for uh, powering up our phones and, uh, and topping them off on a daily basis. When we've deployed a device out in the field um, for five to, uh, to 10 years, it's really difficult to change the battery on a regular basis. So the next category, which is really interesting, and this is where we're gonna dive into some of the technology behind this, is low power wide area networking. Specifically, we're gonna take a look at, at LoRa networks, but we will also touch about Sigfox, um, Ingenues, uh, RPMA uh, technology, and also Weightless. Um, so these are emerging um, uh, standards out there right today, and what they're really good for is long range um, RF. Uh, great battery capabilities uh, and also uh, low cost. These are great ways to get adoption inside here. Now here's the, here's the drawback on this particular technology. It has a, um, it has a, low, da uh, a low data rate, right? So um, what, what we're looking at is it's not really good for, for high data rate applications like video and other things. So, but perfect for sensor-based technologies. So really what we have to do is look at what's the right technology for the right deployment. So, but on average though, and here's a great uh, a survey that came out from our friends, uh, James uh, uh, Brim and Associates. Um, they looked at over 3,000 um, customers that are doing IoT today or machine to machine communications. Um, and uh, although this is primarily cellular based, what they found was that only 4% really used uh, on average per month from the end device about 10 megs per month. 
and about 11% was between 3 and 10%. And again, 6% um, of those 3,000, uh, about 2 to 3 megs per month, and then 4% uh, at the 1 to 2. But by far, 75% of these particular uh, devices that were deployed um, used about less than a meg a month. Meaning that, you know, uh, we're probably looking at uh, maybe a, a thousand kilobits per day, which tells me that we're not really needing huge amounts of data. What we're really looking at is tiny data. So let's take a look at what the forecast is for, for the industry um, and industrial IoT forecast through 2020. What's great is we're going to see great adoption. So this kind of falls in line with the original um, uh, slide that I put up. About uh, uh, 300 million cellular connections today, about 3 million satellite connections. And in this unlicensed short range perspective, which is the, the big yellow uh, piece today, we, we have um, about 78 million, right? Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, 2.4 billion connected devices. And then um, and, and the LP WAN connection, which is really hard to see, it's kind of a, an orange slice inside here. It's just beginning in about 78 million devices. And then, of course, uh, a wireline connection, 1.1 billion connections. But by 2020, we see a large increase, um, specifically in the cellular. So it jumps from 300 million to 900 million, close to a billion connections. And really, in less than four short years, three short years, uh, we're going to see uh, close to a billion cellular connections. Now, satellite really doesn't change all that much, but we'll get to about 7.5 million, according to James's. Uh, uh, statistics here. Uh, we'll see large gains in short range technologies, but in LP WAN, we'll see a dramatic growth, about 900 million alone. Um, and so this is uh, close to a billion connections using this LPWA. Unfortunately, we're going to see, or, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, the wireline connections are going to see uh, losses over a period of time. So um, IoT needs a new network, and we believe that new network is LoRa. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other technologies inside here, but this meets uh, the needs for IoT, and Multitech has partnered with Semtech, ARM, and IBM, and others to deliver a low-cost network uh, that performs. I kind of look at it as a three-legged stool. Um, Semtech is the patriarch of the technology, the chip manufacturer, um, making a, a really neat line of sight uh, technology uh, and modulation scheme that can get you up to 10 miles of range. Great for indoor uh, penetration and being able to connect devices uh, both indoor and outdoor. ARM has the ability of placing uh, processing on the edge. And uh, IBM brings to the table the ability to be able to scale in software analytics. Now, we've placed all these particular elements into our module in a strategy. Um, and we'll, we'll share a little bit more about that in just a little bit. But let's talk a little bit about LoRa. What, what, what exactly is it, right? So it's, a, um, it's an alliance. It's a technology that's out there based on uh, a chirp spread spectrum technology. Um, it actually had its foundations in research back in the early 40s um, in uh, analyzing how dolphins communicated uh, in the water. Uh, and that technology was actually developed and used in the uh, U.S. military. Um, but the LoRa, uh, but LoRa itself is, uh, has, a, has evolved from that chirp spread spectrum technology and has a pretty advanced modulation scheme. And so Semtech has deployed this and, and created um, uh, an alliance of members to help standardize this technology. And today there's over 270 members um, in this, and you know, proud to say that Multitech is a, a founding member of this, uh, of this alliance, uh, along with uh, many others. Um, but we, we're really focusing on the technology, the strategy, the technology, certification, the marketing, and security around these products. So um, without sounding so much like a commercial, I'll get into the technology itself. So what is LoRa, right? So LoRa is a long-range, and that's what LoRa is an acronym, means long-range RF technology. And it uses the ISM band. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but really, it allows us to get some really great ranges. So let's do a compare and contrast. Now, you'll argue that maybe Bluetooth can have a range that's 30 feet, and maybe you can see it up to 50 or a little bit further, depending on if you're using the new standards of BLE. 
but we have a short, it's relatively short range in general. Wi-Fi is also considered uh, a short range technology. Um, even though we see municipal deployments of Wi-Fi, um, those have a, a longer range strategy, but we have an awful lot of access points for folks to be able to connect with. But on average, between 100 feet to about 200 feet, Zigbee holds a lot of promise, right, in its uh, uh, deployment of a mesh technology to get about 1,000 feet um, from uh, its various nodes, but it uses uh, a, a mesh technology to uh, hop and uh, be able to provide that connectivity. And then another modulation scheme called uh, frequency shift keying, very popular out there today as well, can get a, a very large uh, distance up to about two miles of range, but it can fall short with noise um, and interference. Uh, LoRa has this capability to be able to go further and up to about 10 miles, as the data sheet says. The reality is we mm -hmm. see something closer to about five miles with good antennas. But in, 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 in short, there is a way to be able to deploy this um, for a long, long range technology. So let's talk a little bit about RF. We're not gonna go terribly deep, but we will wanna be able to touch on the technology itself, right? So it's a spread spectrum based modulation. And what it does is it's, uh, it, it's using the ISM band and it uses a chirp to be able to send um, this band of information across. Um, it demodulates below the noise floor, which is really important, right? So we're using uh, a 915 megahertz here in the US and 868 over in Europe. I'll talk about the other bands that have recently come out here in just a little bit. But the neat part is that it, it works really well in coexistence of other RF technologies, even in the same frequency, but it operates underneath the noise floor. It has better sensitivity than free frequency shift keying and it has more robust interference for noise and jamming. The neat part about it is that uh, across the bandwidth and uh, on a single channel, we can have multiple data rates, and we can actually occupy um, the same channel at the same time with other, with other ex uh, existing networks. Um, and so basically, there's also, it's very tolerant of uh, frequency offsets. So those are a couple of really neat attributes of the technology that allows, uh, allows us to be able to deploy en masse. So not to go too terribly deep here, but uh, what we want to be able to share here is that with the Semtech chip on the, the, the SX1272 chipset that Multitech deploys on our M dots and X dots, there are three different bandwidths that uh, are occupied or used all at the same time. It's 125 uh, hertz, 250 hertz, and 500 kilohertz, right? So um, uh, in addition, LoRa uses, or the LoRa WAN standard uses all three of these technologies together. In North America, we use 125 and 500 kilohertz, right? But what this, this idea is that we are able to use the entire bandwidth of, uh, of, of this frequency and be able to have multiple data rates at the same time, which allows us uh, to be able to have a range of, uh, of data link budget and, uh, and speed from between um, 300 bits per second up to 20 kilobits per second. Um, so this is some of the technology behind it. Now let's look at compare and contrast. My apologies for the slide in advance, right? This is, violates every marketing standard out there that says you should only have six points of data and an image on a single slide. So I've, I've totally uh, <laughs> obliterated uh, this particular um, slide. But here we're seeing some, some compare and contrast of the various technologies out there. And I was invited to, to invite, uh, put a few additional slides um, in here. The one thing I want to call out in this particular um, slide is that there are uh, three elements that I think make a, a really good use case. So um, I want you to take a look at uh, the, the, the uh, maximum data rates between all these different technologies. Look at the, um, the link budget and all these technologies, and then also look at the power efficiencies of all these particular technologies. And I'm just going to walk quickly through these. I know there will be a lot of questions on this, and so you'll have this, this information for your review later on. 
But this is where we see these two worlds of low power wide area network uh, that are available today. And, um, and then where cellular is coming uh, in these two worlds of one being LTE high bandwidth and coming down to narrow band or uh, uh, low bandwidth options uh, using an LTE standard. So basically it's the difference between uh, lo um, low power wide area networking that's available today and the promise of future cellular technologies that are coming. And it's a really exciting world in both these categories. Um, so we placed LoRa up here. Uh, we see multiple frequency bands. Um, so this uses, as I mentioned, the ISM band. Um, and uh, it supports, you know, 433, 480, 780, and also 8, uh, 868, 915 um, uh, across. Now we'll see uh, other technologies very similar, uh, Sigfox and uh, RPMA, or Ingenue's um, technology here, and all of these have very similar capabilities, right, but we have different business models behind them. And we'll talk a little bit about how the business models differ here in just a little bit. But this is a, a digital spread set spectrum, and what we're seeing is data rates um, might be very critical for, for particular applications. And so uh, Laura enjoys, uh, as I mentioned, close to 300 bits per second, up to 50 kilobits per second. Um, and then we see the other technologies, uh, Sigfox and RPMA, um, slightly, uh, slightly lower in some uh, categories, slightly higher in others, uh, depending on how you get to market and how you get to market quickly. I'd, I'd highlight link budget is one of those areas that's uh, very important. Uh, the amount of data that you will be able to carry it and the serialization of that data onto the link itself. And so what we'll see is a, a high utilization in the LoRa standard itself. Um, and then uh, the battery power capabilities on these uh, are, are, is very high across, uh, across LoRa WAN, Sigfox, and RPMA. Now, in contrast, you know, we have macro networks where LTE is coming into play, and this new version of LTE called Category 1, uh, which is supported on release 8 uh, of LTE today, the carriers have created a really great technology, uh, with, uh, and the ecosystems created a really great technology in deployment. And so um, LTE Cat 1 is now available. It's a lower cost module. It actually has very good bandwidth capabilities. Um, it has uh, so, uh, uh, an excellent max data rate uh, up 10 megabits. And then, um, but the challenge and drawback is that the power efficiency is still relatively low. There's a newer technology that's coming out, um, and there's uh, a range of when it's going to arrive, right? Um, and we've seen some carriers be very uh, aggressive in deployment of, uh, of, uh, of CAT-M, uh, but this is the newer standard that we will see that carriers need to move to release 13. And, uh, and, and LTE, we're going to see um, this CAT-M really start taking adoption. This is where the two roads meet, I would say, um, and we're starting to see where uh, the cost of the modules will start to come down on the cellular piece. We'll still start to see um, the, the data rates being very comparable at uh, 380 kilobits per second. Uh, and, but more importantly, we're starting to see um, this ability to have a better power efficiency, but still it's medium and, and to run on batteries exclusively could be a challenge on some, uh, some applications depending on how often they connect, connect and communicate. Um, the next wave of cellular-based communications that we'll see, uh, and it's proposed to be coming out around 2018, is, uh, is the CAT-M, uh, which is an LTE CAT-M or narrow band IoT. And that's expected to come out. And this is where we really see these two, these two roads of cellular and low power wide area network coming together. Um, and so this is, this is really when we start to see this. We, we haven't seen the, sam there's few samples that have come out just yet. The question is when we're gonna see the carriers deploy it. So um, in this communication comparison, we've got lots of players inside here. What I wanna leave with you today is there are technologies that can be deployed today that are standards-based and available to the market. So where do the LP, LPWA applications reside, right? So where, where do we see the use cases? Well, in large areas, where, wherever we see uh, a battery power communication, we really take advantage, plus this long-range capability. 
Smart cities, um, great, great application here uh, where we see metering, sub-metering, parking, and security and fire alarms where we need to have um, kind of a, a bi-directional communication and uh, an acknowledgement of that communication. This is, a, this is a great, perfect use case. Smart agriculture is another area that's, uh, that's fast growing. Uh, environmental sensors and looking at our precious you know, resources uh, called water that we're placing out there. And smart agriculture really is an area where we're seeing uh, developments. And building management, um, building management and facility management specifically. So uh, this, these all have various use cases and can really be used for different technologies. So we have a great little spider chart, um, chart here on our, on our right that kind of shows you an LTE deployment and where those technologies would fit pretty well, a CAT-M deployment and where those would fit well as far as devices that might be maybe body-worn or perhaps wearables, um, looking at home automation and healthcare. But, and when we start to see um, wide area, low data rate pieces, this is where we're seeing LPWA shine uh, in the areas of tank monitoring facilities management and parking management. I've got another graph that kind of gives a, 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 a succinct outlook of where, where uh, which of these technologies uh, should be used. And uh, you'll see where we see cellular connection types where we need larger broadband connections that are natural, right? But as we start to see these two technologies really come together when we start to look at tel telemetry type data, uh, specifically industrial IoT type scenarios. Uh, we still see a bleed over a little bit in the wearable space, uh, depending on where, where and when these uh, networks get deployed. Um, but this is, uh, is primarily, I, I, will, I will say this, um, we see macro networks being deployed using wide, uh, this low powered wide area network throughout the world. Um, it's not as fa fast adopted here in the U.S. as, as it is in Europe um, and uh, other parts of the world. However, I will say that there's a private network deployment that's happening at a very alarming rate. So um, there's, a, there's kind of a, a hybrid approach that's happening between these two technologies. And let's, let's talk a little bit about that hybrid approach. Here's how we're seeing LPWA networks being deployed. We have end nodes that uh, basically are connecting to what seems like access points on the network using this low-powered wide area network. I will remind you at this point, these are not IP elements on the far left. These are, these are devices that are going to be using RF, and these devices may have varying degrees of intelligence on them. Um, parsing data and setting up using this technology and then aggregating at the edge. And on the edge of this network, there's these, the concentrators, these, these folks that can be used, uh, these, these aggregation points or access points out here that can uh, actually process data locally and then parse it out to the network or can be just a packet forwarder to the network. So there's various business models here that um, companies are looking at whether they are deploying their own macro networks and processing in, uh, at the network service layer in the cloud, or are they looking at placing the application directly on the edge of the network on the gateway. This is the approach that Multitech has taken to help uh, uh, speed up adoption for both private networks and public networks, uh, exposing microcontrollers and, uh, and processors on the edge of the network to process that data prior to sending to network. And eventually these applications go up to the individual at the, at the enterprise or perhaps are shared at, uh, at the network layer. The point here is that we have a way to provide security and deployment from the end nodes all the way up to the application server. I'm sure we'll have questions on this particular side. And to give you a kind of a, a demonstration of, uh, of what uh, uh, an ecosystem approach would be, I'm going to use this, this illustration of a building management in a hotel. In a hotel, there's lots of different systems that are out there, uh, and many of them in the past would have in a machine-to-machine -machine world or an M2M uh, deployment, they'd all have their own purpose-built networks. Some of them might be cellular, some of them might be other or private networks. But here's a, com uh, a nice hybrid approach where we see a gateway um, that's aggregating this uh, information, processing various uh, different elements and systems out there. Could be um, in the kitchen for industrial equipment, could be in the laundry area where we're seeing usage base of, uh, of consumables that are being used in, in that kitchen area or perhaps maintenance. The HVAC itself, a pool and spa, we're looking at inventory on a, on a general approach. 
All this information would be fed up directly to, to the aggregator, and various applications could be residing locally and then parsing that data out to send information rather than data up to the cloud. At this point, you have options to be able to have a wireline connection out to, um, to the public network or private network, or be able to use a cellular backhaul, which is really where we can take advantage of this LTE infrastructure. And from there, we can start to broker data, and that data can be aggregated and look at all other types of hotels that might be out there and start to look at trends and really start to pull and be able to pull more information or less depending on what's needed. The point here is that we're, we're seeing processing happening down at the node level. We're seeing process ha processing happening at the um, aggregation or gateway level. And again, we'll see um, processing happening at the cloud level. So while I get a chance to take uh, another sip of my water here, I'm going to invite uh, um, Mr. Greg to come back and help us with our next polling slide, please. Thanks, Michael. And uh, this time I remembered to uh, hit the mute button. Last time I was talking to the mute button. Apologize for that. But yeah, here's a polling question for you. Please uh, take a look at that and answer it. Uh, now, this question is based on M2M -M technologies. This is not uh, don't don't respond based upon your cell phone your company has or how your laptops connect. This is more for machine-to-machine -machine communication connectivity or Internet of Things connectivity technologies. So which ones does your company use today? Do they use cellular or LPWAN such as LoRa like Michael's been chatting about? Or is it more of a uh, uh, LAN technologies, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, short-range things, or are they use an analog dial-up. Analog dial-up is still uh, used quite a bit out there in the marketplace, but as those lines are becoming more expensive and harder to procure and their line quality is degrading, um, some people are moving to uh, a different technology. Yeah. Um, That's right, but, Greg. That's right. And look, uh, and, and I'm seeing some of the results are really reflecting um, some of our, our discussion earlier. Yeah, look, there, there still is a ton of analog dial-up business because of private network concerns or HIPAA compliance. Um, and although this seems like a very slow, a low um, amount of data, uh, it's actually pretty huge. I think, Greg, you, you've done some research in this area where there's something like 40 million um, measured business lines that are being used today for various reasons, right? Um, exactly. So that, that, makes up, that makes up a huge number. Correct, correct. So, but look at the results here, Michael. It looks like uh, cellular's about 50% of the companies, and then obviously the uh, the short-range LAN technologies uh, has quite a bit as well. Um, yeah. But Laura and LPWAN um, does have a 10% section in there, so that's interesting. You know, this almost matches that graph that we saw earlier, uh, the industrial forecast through 2020. Uh, this is this is really yeah. quite amazing, right? Uh, great. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback. This is this is really really fun to see um, see your your input here, and I'm looking forward to our Q and A discussions coming up next. Well, thank you, Greg. This is uh, thanks for the polling question and helps guide guide where we're going. So, distributed technology, right? Our distributed intelligence um, and de uh, development tools. Um, Part of this technology evolution, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what I was talking about is processing on the edge. We're really proud at Multitech that we've um, kind of adopted some best practices out here to take a look at um, uh, using um, processing on the edge and on our nodes. I'm going to talk a little bit about where this is coming from. Many of you may be familiar with this, so I'm, I'm going to move and depart a little bit from, from, from communications and talk a little bit about processing. So, ARM uh, makes intellectual property around um, devices and chips uh, and, of course, uses the ecosystem to create those, uh, those chips and deploy in, en masse. And so uh, ARM has uh, these microcontrollers. Um, we decided that it's um, important to have uh, communication modules that are pre-certified and ready to go that people can adopt and, and get into the market quickly. But what's also important is that we have the ability to have some intelligence on the edge, the ability to, to aggregate and use the module itself because these end devices, if we're talking about a um, – parking meter or maybe a pet tracker or whatever um, these elements uh, could be out there or an ATM machine, they all have varying levels of processing power. And uh, some applications you just don't want to expose out there and you're going to lock those down. 
So the ability for the module itself to have a microcontroller on there is really important for us to be able to bring in new sensor-based uh, solutions. Because face it, we're going to have to retrofit uh, a lot of uh, manual-based uh, devices that are out there that were uh, not able to have the intelligence. And so a great way to augment that is with the communication module and have some intelligence there that we can be able to bring in other technologies. ARM has a, a, um, a platform, a device platform called Embed. And Embed is a crowdsourcing capability for us to be able to uh, basically program these uh, various microcontrollers on a, like, in a crowdsourcing method. So we can take best practices of machine language using C and C++ and the ability to take a look at the drivers and the subdrivers and be able to bring them up and compile directly on those particular devices. Great way for us to be able to not only prototype, but to move into production very quickly and to make that happen. So I'm really happy to see and to be working with ARM uh, and their microcontroller. So I have kind of a funny slide next to show you about why would we push um, intelligence to the edge, right? And to the left side, you see this in uh, intelligent distributed computing environment. And to the right, you'll see this, what traditional IoT cloud computing can happen. Okay, yes, I'm biased. This is, this is my slide. Um, and it's kind of m more funny than anything. Um, the idea is this, is that if you're going to push all your data up to the cloud to process, it's creating a tsunami of data uh, to your servers. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's really necessary to collect the whole data set. I, I understand that. Um, but what we're, we're proposing here is that um, the data set can still be intact and can still come to the host site. Um, but what we're proposing is that sending, we should send uh, information rather than just data. Something that could be processed locally uh, at the edge um, or at the node level or at the edge and then sent to the cloud, um, reducing potentially the amount of data that's coming to your servers uh, in your server environment. I will say this, though. Um, this is kind of a fallacy, right? I, I, I'd like to say that we reduce the amount of data by putting intelligence at the edge, but the reality is that the more interesting data that you send or interesting information that you send to the cloud, um, you, you want to get more of it and you start to interrogate it and go further into it and you actually start to collect more data uh, after the fact. So uh, as, as, as it sounds like we're going to reduce the amount of data, uh, the reality is we, we probably will be increasing it just and, and, and creating another tsunami, just like the right side. But the point is, how can you be efficient with your deployments and why to push intelligence to the edge um, really makes uh, you know an outcomes-based decision, right? So that's that, that's really what I wanted to propose uh, in this slide. Although it's kind of fun to see this kind of a, a tsunami here that reminds me back to uh, what was that movie, The Abyss, or something like that. So fun stuff. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what 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 are these modules, right? And we've got just a little bit, and we're gonna have to move to Q and A. So I'm gonna breeze through these last few slides. Um, modules that are pre-certified, we've got some dots out here um, that um, Multitech manufacturers using our M dot and our X dot. Um, these are two, uh, you know, really becoming household names on a global basis here uh, for, for modules to be deployed uh, uh, for, for Laura WAN. And so uh, having a microcontroller that's on our Cortex-M4 processor locally um, and uh, compatible with an XP pinout uh, capability here, um, and the ability to have onboard memory. And then our new X dot, which we've uh, re released out to the market, which also has uh, a more uh, energy efficient uh, a processor on it, but a, a much uh, better uh, uh, power, power levels here uh, using a Cortex M3. Uh, but what's really special about the X dot is that we add a secured element uh, directly onto this, uh, bringing and adding an additional identity management layer um, using a secure element and even secure SIM capability for, for this uh, deployments for these end nodes. So really, really like that, uh, that, that scenario. At the host end, um, we're looking at the ability to run um, a Linux-based infrastructure. And uh, a Linux base that would be an open standard to be able to develop uh, yourself, uh, to create your own applications to support Java, um, Node-RED.js, Perl, Ruby, Python, many different languages uh, to be able to de deploy yourself. Um, in addition to that, we've, we've also looked at scalability, and this is where that IBM uh, uh, logo came into place, uh, deploying an application enablement platform where we could be able to have uh, a Node-RED uh, environment, which is an object-oriented um, uh, environment to be able to quickly scale applications 
uh, look at configurations and push them out en masse, um, a great way to be able to scale. Uh, we see great things happening in, in, um, with, uh, with this Node-RED infrastructure and many deployments on what we call AEP. I'll talk a little bit about um, that deployment, but these gateways are set up to be able to be processing nodes or little servers on the edge, if you would. Uh, and so we have a couple different flavors of this, one being uh, an industrial environment which can be deployed, um, which has multiple um, accessory cards that can be placed in there to, to have different ways to do this. Uh, also an IP67 rated device, uh, which is really a carrier class deployment so you can create your own macro network or private network. And lastly, making sure that the program works with the various IoT uh, clouds that are out there um, and, uh, and aggregating the LoRa server or gateway that's the aggregation server resides directly on these concentrators, or you have an option to place that uh, server in the cloud on mass, right? So just uh, to go through that. And uh, now just to hit real briefly, because I want to save some time for questions here, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to support these things without looking at lifecycle management. So um, this concept is the ability to have a, a device headquarters or device HQ, a way to be able to command and control these devices. So we include this in the cost of our product um, and have the ability to be able to look at the firmware, look at upgrades, do custom configurations using this particular tool. It's very important to be able to know what's happening and have asset management out there. But important also is to take a look at what vertical applications you might be deploying across this. And so this platform also becomes an interesting app store, a way that developers can be able to create unique vertical applications and be able to deploy them uh, in a private fashion or open it up in a market fashion to be able to sell those applications and take this, these horizontal platforms and, and make them vertical. Okay, and I'm just going to touch real briefly about us. Um, so uh, here we go. Um, we're a manufacturer um, out of Mounds View, Minnesota. Uh, we have on-site manufacturing here. Uh, maxim we have maximum control of our facility, 100% uh, functional, functional testing uh, directly here. We, we adhere to ISO standards. And as Greg said in the earl earlier, we've been in business for well over 45 years and know how to see many different life cycles throughout that. And we have well over a 15-year tenure uh, of, uh, of trained individuals uh, that are in our, in our staff, many of which have been, and that's an average number throughout there, um, have been with us for, for, uh, since the beginning of Multitech. So um, we have the ability to, to uh, have traceability of our parts down to the component level, and we, we do great supply chain management of all of our vendors. So, uh, and this needs to happen for to, to adhere to ISO standards. And we're also an ISO 13485 um, shop, meaning that we can help create medical grade devices or communication for medical grade devices, um, and, uh, and we adhere to their standards. So uh, that's a little touch on, on quality. And we have a, a large array of, uh, of solutions that are out here. So the end of the commercial, commercial here, from gateways to embedded cellular devices and uh, plug and play, just straight bit pipe com solutions and, and developer caps. We have a broad portfolio and family of products. The big piece here is that we'd love to be able to, to chat with folks to find out where these two roads lead, low power, wide area network, or cellular-based, low-power, wide-area network, we do both, right? So we're happy to be able to support and support the market in these uh, solutions. And so I'm looking forward to some questions. Let's get to our conclusion slide here. And uh, so in, in summary, different technologies, different applications, there's no one size that fits all. I propose that we're going to see hybrid technologies happening here, whether they're cellular and low-power wide area network, um, or cellular and LoRa, or maybe even wireline and LoRa. We're going to see all kinds of this combinations and hybrids that really make it, you know, deployable. Uh, it's available now. It's fast growing. And so we encourage you to, to chat with us and, and to others in the industry and really kind of dig into these various technologies to see how they apply to you. So, Greg, I'm going to hand over to you now, please. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Michael. So uh, we have one last polling question here. So Michael's gone over a, a lot of material very quickly. Um, and as you can tell, it's a very uh, dynamic, growing industry with a lot of connectivity technologies that are available. And it's pretty fragmented as well, which Multitech is trying to uh, 
put together the right partners to bring together uh, a good solution for you guys. So if you like what you've heard and you have some uh, questions on how to implement IoT connectivity for your application and bringing the right parties together, uh, please select yes on this, this question here and uh, we will definitely reach out to you and, uh, and, and get some solutions going for you and, and your area. So with that, I think we're going to jump into the questions here. So let's take a look at what we have queued up. Michael, the, the first one I see here is, says, uh, I'm not a, an RF expert. Are there any embedded platforms which are pre-certified, allowing me to upgrade to new technology carriers without needing to recertify my cellular solution every time it changes? Yeah, hey, that's a that's a great question, um, um, Greg. I, I, I see this uh, this happens a lot. There's a lot of confusion around a certification and devices that are certified. Um, the mo modules may be certified uh, with uh, or be cellular certified, but <laughs> uh, not necessarily N certified with 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 the carriers that uh, that they go across. So um, yes. So one of the the value propositions that uh, that our company uh, focuses on is creating pre-certified um, solutions, both uh, FCC and CE certifications across uh, the globe, and then look at various carrier certifications that, that are needed if it's cellular. Uh, and uh, if it's, uh, it's uh, long-range RF, we make sure that we look at the standards bodies and, and that we're compliant with those. And so this is really becomes a, uh, a build versus buy um, decision proposition. And uh, you know the, the fun part is we, we, help, we help customers with both. We do RF designs through our connected development team uh, in North Carolina, great shop to be able to do that. So if you want to build your own, we can help with reference designs. But primarily, if you want to get to market quickly um, and be able to have a consumable product uh, and not have to go through the, uh, the, the time and the cycle to do that, a pre-certificate pre-certified product helps uh, to get to market quickly and can avoid any pain of uh, trying to get deployed when, when it's not quite meeting up to snuff. So, yeah, that, that's okay. a great question, and I think we, we can move on to the next one. Thanks. All right. Uh, the next one here I think I'll take. It says, uh, what is the 2G shutdown that I've heard about? Mm -hmm. And the 2G shutdown is just that, you know, some of the cellular carriers have announced that they were shutting down or, or sunsetting their 2G cellular technology like uh, GPRS or 1XRTT for the CDMA network. And the 2G network is, is really an older, slower technology, but still had a lot of use in a lot of M2M -M IoT applications. However, the, the carriers are needing to refarm that 2G spectrum to a more efficient 4G LTE spectrum. So that's why they're starting to move people off of 2G. Um, they've usually provided a pretty long runway for that shutdown date, meaning years to make that happen. Uh, however, you know, some of the major carriers have announced the end of this year, 2016, as the end date for their 2G network. So uh, once again, you can you know, contact your carrier or, or Multitech for more information on how to get those, uh, those products upgraded. Yeah, hey, Greg, that's a great point, right? So sometimes these, uh, this technology, this is a perfect time for technology refresh. And so um, maybe it's cellular, maybe looking at Cat1 type scenarios, or, or perhaps in some cases a, a low-powered wide area network solution makes, uh, may, may make a lot of sense for folks to be able to deploy a new technology. So great, great question. Okay. Um, another question here is uh, what market vertical have you had the most experience with? Thanks. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, so Multitech has been around for a while, and uh, so we've had lots of different verticals that we have experience with. By far, we've been uh, chosen in the healthcare area for healthcare deployments, um, and our cellular technologies are, are well adopted in that space, as well as uh, a smart grid and, um, and utilities uh, market is also where, where we find a lot of industrial. That's where really where we fit quite well. Um, is in the industrial markets. Uh, but that's not to say that we're not seeing the, these new technologies uh, like low-powered wide area network gaining tremendous adoption in, uh, in smart cities, building management, automation projects, as well as uh, agriculture. Um, those are the primaries there. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Okay, great. Uh, and then I guess another one here is, uh, remember we were talking about that 10% people have the analog dial-up networks. One of the questions here is, what are my options to migrate from my legacy analog application? And, you know, what they're talking about is, you know, the plain old telephone line, POTS lines, analog lines, copper lines, 
that's what Multitech cut their teeth on back in the early days and have a huge analog following and quite honestly have quite a, quite a few uh, analog customers right now. Um, very secure, point-to-point -point transmission works well, but now as these lines are becoming more costly and the operating costs are going up, uh, they're, they're expensive to maintain by both the carrier side and the user side. There are people are looking to migrate to an IP network. And so, you know, Multitech has a, a converter product that you can use out in the field, which will convert that signal from analog to cellular, so you don't need to change that asset out in the field. And you can keep it out there and extend the life because the connectivity portion is going to be uh, wireless instead of analog. Um, otherwise, like Michael mentioned earlier, we have a, a very wide variety of modems, routers, and gateways, both boxed and embedded, to get you into a wireless IP strategy. So um, probably going to need to move that along at some point, um, something to think about and, and to roadmap out. Yeah, I think we have time for just one last, last one here, and then we have to wrap. Um, I'd like to, to, to address this uh, security standards for LPWA. Um, so th thank you for asking the question about security. It's really important, right? Um, so we've seen uh, for these node and elements to, to network and to, to the gateways uh, using an AES encryption, uh, which is great. We're creating a, you know, a, a really strong tunnel that's happening back. Um, but you know what, what, what has been lacking out there is the idea of having identity management. And so I'm really proud of what, what Multitech has done in moving to and placing a, a physical chip, a, you know, something at clock zero that does identity management and putting you know, a secure element directly on our, our, our X dot, um, adding that next layer of security as well as the tunneling that happens throughout. And I think what we'll see is um, the, these uh, security deployments will uh, come to more of a, a trusted continuum rather than just perimeter-based security. And so these, this is an area that I think will really be taking off in the near future. Um, and uh, we're seeing customers are asking and demanding for these technologies. So great to be able to have application-based security, great to have great tunneling technologies, but adding uh, the identity management piece is key. So. Um, with that, I would just want to say thank you very much, everybody, for allowing uh, us, uh, both Greg and I, to present today. We really enjoyed um, uh, being here today and great questions, and we really uh, would love to be able to invite you to continue our conversation and hope to see you at one of these conferences coming up real soon, uh, or feel free to reach out to us at, at uh, our contact information here. So, again, thank you very much.